Amen. I'd like to preach to you a message entitled, Beware, Three Sins to Put Off in Your Christian Life. Beware, Three Sins to Put Off in Your Christian Life. Let me see if I can get through this in a very, very clear way, this introduction. Trust in Christ as your Savior uh, and being justified by the work of the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that power to save people, that, that Jesus rested, did, did you see that line, rested or wrestled victory out of the grave, the victory to save us. That, that fact in your life is not the finish line. It is not the finish line of God changing you on this earth. And ra- it's rather the starting line, the starting place, when you trust Christ to save you. Though now, because of Christ, you're perfectly justified in the sight of God. And I say hallelujah to that. As far as sin's condemnation eternally against you, you will never be held accountable as far as damnation for your sin ever, ever, ever. Although that is true, it is the plan of God to use that great change in you of being a new creature, a new man in Christ, the Holy Spirit taking up residence in you, the power of the cross and the resurrection applying to you as tools at your disposal. It is God's will to use that to conform you right now out of sinfulness and into conforming to be like Jesus. Okay, getting saved is just the starting point of that. It's just the starting point of what he wants to do in your earthly life. We call this It has been called sanctification, being set apart progressively to the Lord. It is not more salvation. It is because of salvation. And one of the aspects of sanctification, only one of the aspects, is putting off sin and putting on righteousness or attributes of Jesus. Again, this this can only happen by the power of Christ in us. Striving to do this shows submission to God, shows appreciation for our great salvation, we're not doing it to get our salvation. We're getting, we're, we are putting off sin to say, thank you for my salvation. Amen. Yes, you get the difference. Yeah. It's not a guilt-driven Christianity. It is a, an appreciation. It's a thanksgiving-driven Christianity. It shows belief that God's holy way is best, and it's more beautiful. And I'm gonna, I want to live his way. I don't want to f- throw off the ugliness. I want to live his way because it's more beautiful because God's way is always best, and it just shows love back to God. Listen, I want to do things for Amy because I love her, and, and that's not hard to do because I love her. You know, putting off sin is just showing love. It's a way to love God back. And today, through the life of Isaac, we've been preaching through the Genesis origins, the study of Genesis, through the life of Isaac, we're going to see three sin areas to put off to glorify God, to put off so that you will glorify the Lord by the fight and by the putting of it off. Genesis 26, please, in your Bibles. Genesis chapter 26. For those who are visiting, we have preached here. Uh, It is our custom to preach through books of the Bible. Um, It's called expository preaching. We go verse by verse, preaching the the word in the sense that the Lord has given it from the meaning uh, that he gave it. Genesis 26. Would you stand, please, as we read God's word? I want to read through verse 17. We come to Genesis 26. This is the very word of God. There was a famine in the land beside the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went to, unto Abimelech, king of the Philistines, unto Gerar. And the Lord appeared unto him and said, Go not down unto, into Egypt. Dwell in the land which I shall tell thee of. Sojourn in this land, the promised land, and I will be with thee and will bless thee and unto thee and unto thy seed. Uh, I will give all these countries. I will perform the oath which I swear unto Abraham thy father. And I will make thy seed to multiply as the stars of heaven and will give unto thy seed all these countries and and in thy seed shall uh, all the nations of the earth be blessed. Look up here, please. That's the Abrahamic covenant. We've been preaching it clear since we saw Abraham. Great promises to Abraham passed down to Isaac, passed down to Jacob. This is the Abrahamic covenant. The last phrase of it, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. That is through eventually Jesus Christ would come and be our Savior. The Savior to all nations. Verse 5. Because that Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. And Isaac dwelt in Gerar. And the men of the place asked him of his wife. And, and he said, she is my sister. Hello. 
Really? Deja vu? Really? Okay. For he feared to say, she is my wife. Yes, we've heard this before. Lest, lest said he, the men of the place should kill me for Rebecca, because she was fair to look upon me. She was beautiful. And it came to pass when he had been there a long time that Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked out of the window and saw, and behold, Isaac was sporting with Rebecca, his wife. And Abimelech called unto Isaac and said, Behold, of a surety, she is, she is thy wife. And how saidst thou, she is my sister? And Isaac said unto him, Because I said, lest I die for her. And Abimelech said, What is this that thou hast done unto us? One of the people might have lightly have lain with thy wife. That must have been a pretty promiscuous um, town, by the way. And thou shouldest have brought guiltiness upon us. And Abimelech charged all his people, saying, He that toucheth this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. Then Isaac sowed in that land and received in that same year a hundredfold. And the Lord blessed him. And the man waxed great and went forward and grew until he became very great. And he had possessions of flocks and possessions of herds and great store of servants. And and the Philistines envied him, envied him. For all the wells which uh, his father's servants had digged in the days of Abraham, his fathers, the Philistines had stopped them and filled them with earth, with dirt. And And Abimelech said unto Isaac, Go from us, for thou art much mightier than we. And Isaac departed thence and pitched his tent in the valley of Gerar and dwelt there. You may be seated. It had been about 100 years since Genesis 12 when the promised land had seen such a serious famine. You remember that Abraham had done the wrong thing. He had fled to Egypt. Well, it seems that eastward, okay, Isaac is dwelling and sojourning with this huge encampment. It seems that eastward, near the Great Sea coastline, in in the area of Gerar, which was Philistine country, still in the Promised Land, but Philistine country at that time, the famine was not as bad. And so Isaac packed up his great nomad encampment and went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines. This king, you will remember, has the same name as the king that Abraham went to see, uh, I think it was Genesis 20, but it's, it's likely not him. It's likely his son who's named a, a, after him or, or a relative that he passed down the crown to that is his namesake. God uses this opportunity, though, to appear to Isaac in verse number two and ensure him of his faithfulness and of his commitment to him and the, all the blessings of the Abrahamic covenant. As, as committed as he was to Abraham in his lifetime, he shows up and he's going to keep showing up in the next couple chapters and reminding him and repeating his faithfulness. He wants Isaac to know, I'm here for you. I'm committed to you. I'm going to bless you. I have chosen you. I'm going to bless the entire world for your name's sake. Look at verse 2 through 6 again. The Lord appeared to him, said, Go not down to Egypt, dwell in the land which I shall tell thee of. Sojourn in the land, I will, I will be with thee, and I will bless thee. And, and For unto thee and unto thy seed I will give all these countries, and will perform the oath which I swear unto Abraham thy father. And it goes on. This incredible, faithful commitment to God. He had chosen them as a people, and he was going to be faithful to them. God says, Don't go down to Egypt. Stay here in the land that I promised you, and I will be faithful, and I will bless you, and I'll give you all these promises. The tender and loving assurance that that God gives to Isaac in this verse is is very important to remember when we come to verse number or come to point number two in our sermon. So what point are you looking for this at? Point number two, okay? So remember this incredible commitment that he makes to Isaac when we talk about point number two. These are words of love and faithfulness of God's presence to Isaac. And they remind us of the commitment and love of God that he has to us under the new covenant of Jesus. All right, we are not Jewish. We are not the chosen people. Uh, we have a few Jews that attend our church. You're, you may be out there that you are, you know, under the blessings of that covenant. Most of us are in the end of the verse, that all the nations will be blessed. We are under the covenant of Jesus, the new covenant that was signed by his blood. It was literally uh, testified his will that would say that he would bless us and he would never leave us or forsake us. He would be committed to us. We would be his people. We would have never be pulled apart from him. That is the new covenant that the Holy Spirit would write his love on our hearts and his his will and his commands on our hearts. But folks, what I want to point out to you, it is that commitment of love that we see here to Isaac 
it is even so much more so to us who are under the covenant of Jesus. It is exponentially more to us. More on that in a moment. Well, Isaac obeyed God and came, down, came to dwell in this Philistine town called Gerar, or this area, or this country. So look at verse number seven. Uh, the, man, man of the men of the place asked him of his wife. And she said, she is my, he said, she is my sister. For he feared to say, uh, she is my wife. Lest, said he, the men of the place should kill me for Rebekah. Because she was fair, was beautiful to look upon. Sound familiar? Deja vu. Number one, beware of generational sin. Beware of generational sin. What is generational sin? Generational sin means sin that you uh, engage in that was learned from your parents or the generation of your people before you. Generational sin. And this example is the perfect example. If you have been with us, this is through the preaching of of Genesis. This happened twice in Abraham's life. He did this exact same lie, and for him it was a half lie to to, uh, Isaac here. It's just a full, straight-out lie. The example is a perfect example. In Genesis 20, Isaac's daddy lied the exact same way in the exact same town to a king that had the exact same name for the exact same reason. Do you think that perhaps maybe Isaac learned it from his daddy, his parents? Yes. The scientific world is still out on how sinful character traits can actually pass down through the generation, but the evidence of this is very, very clear. It it doesn't excuse it. It doesn't excuse it that you're practicing sin because your daddy, your mommy did, or your uncle, or your grandparents did. But family history is the biggest factor in the repetition of certain sins. Let me say that again. Your family history is the biggest factor in the repetition of certain sins. Let me give you some examples. According to the National Council on Alcoholism and Drug Dependence, children of addicts are eight times more likely to become an addict themselves. You hear that? Eight times more likely. There are many factors in this. The article that I read went on. But the biggest factor is learned behavior. Not some kind of genetic blood. Learned behavior, observed behavior. So that works this way. Parents to kids, I think, that, that are zero to seven years old. Parents are, or it may be 10 years old, but parents are the biggest determinant, the biggest hero, the biggest influence in that child's life. And so the biggest influence they see for good and for bad. It may influence them in great character ways, but it also might influence them in in learned sinful behavior as well. See where I'm going with this, of course. Have you ever considered if you have replicated the sins of your parents in your life and you will pass those on to future generations? Have you considered that? You're not a victim of your family history. You are not a victim of your family history. And by the power of Christ in you, if you are a born-again believer, you can break that cycle right now. Don't hide in victim mentality. A lot of secular counseling talks about the influence of parents on you. And so you, you sit around a lot and you, you talk about, you know, the, it was your mother's fault, it was your father's fault, and the connection there. Listen, we are each held responsible for what we do in this life. You know, it was, in the Old Testament, there was this, this, for a time, there was this principle, the sins of the fathers would be passed down to the third or fourth generation. But then the Lord came back, and as the New Testament came, he says, you are each responsible for your own sin. You are each responsible for your own choices, not the sins of the father on the children. My father passed to me, as I often say, many good examples He taught me how to read my Bible. He taught me how to pray. He taught me that the first thing that happens in the day should be between me and the Lord. He taught me many, many very good things. Hard work. He taught me about family devotions. He taught me a lot of great things. But my father was also a greedy thief who went to prison. And I don't want to learn that. I'm not a victim to become that because he was. You're not a victim of how your parents reared you or their example in your life. 
I can yield my mind, my hands, my body to be a servant of God because of the power of Christ in me. Romans chapter 6 says, and you're going to hear that chapter again. I hope you read this afternoon. You are a Christian, not a, a, a victim of genetic power. You are a victim of Jesus Christ's power. Dwell there. I'm going to say it this way. Jesus' power that comes from his death and his resurrection is so much more power than the bad example of your parents and your grandparents in your life. Some of you come from physical and emotionally abusive homes. I'm so sorry for that. Break that generational sin by God's power. Fight that and claim the power of Christ's resurrection over that. Some of you come from lying homes and stubborn parents and uncaring parents and no-show fathers and perhaps your mother was distant. You, didn't, you, don't have, you don't know what it's like to have a sweet mother to put you on your lap and to hug you and to care about you. Perhaps your parents were coarse and rude. Perhaps your parents were full of pride. Listen, Isaac, your daddy lied at Gerar, but that doesn't mean that you have to. To those that fight, Generational sin, here is your hope. You've heard me say it a couple of times. I want to make it really succinct of how the Bible explains that, especially in Romans 6. You have Christ to fight with you. Christ is your high priest who the scripture says has felt, the, the, have been touched with the feeling of your infirmity. You know that that passage is talking about temptation. It's not necessarily talking about sadness in your life. He knows the power of temptation towards you because he was tempted in all ways, yet did not sin. He knows what it feels like is the point. The one that's going up to bat for you knows what it's like to be incredibly tempted in some area. The argument of scripture is that you can yield your body parts in Romans 6 as instruments of righteousness. You can choose to do righteousness and not, for instance, generational sin because he arose up out of the out of the dead with great power and that same victorious power that, that called him up out of the, the dead that he got up, up out of his grave clothes is the power that he gives you to yield your instruments, your bodies, your members as instruments of righteousness. You think, uh, you think Jesus Christ coming up out of the dead was pretty powerful? Yes or no? Yell it out. Romans 6, you read it. It's the same power that you can tap into to say no to generational sin. In your life. I beg, I want to beg you for the glory of God for the sake of passing on those same sinful generational traits to your own children and grandchildren that you would take this point seriously and you would think of Isaac here and he, sh- he did not have to do what his daddy did. He did not have to do. Beware of generational sin passed down, down, down. Some of you realize that you are turning, we say that kind of in a funny way, that we're turning into our parents. Have you heard that? Some of your spouses, you say, you're turning to your father. Turn your, okay. okay, that can be great if it's in good things, but that can be horrible if it's in generational sin things. Break the cycle. So beware of generational sin. That's one. Number two, all right, number two. Beware of lying to protect yourself. Beware or put off lying to protect yourself. So look at seven through 11. Let, let's see the nature of this sin here. The Bible says, um, let's start at seven and the men of the place asked him of his wife and he said she is my sister for he feared to say she is my wife lest, lest said he the men of the place should kill me for Rebekah because she was fair to look upon and it came to pass when he had been there a long time that Abimelech king of the Philistines looked out a window out at a window and saw and behold Isaac was sporting with Rebekah his wife and Rebekah called Isaac and said behold of a surety she is thy wife and how sayest thou, she is my sister? And Isaac said unto him, Because I said, lest I die for her. And Abimelech says, What is this that thou hast done unto us? One of the people might have lightly lain with thy wife, and thou shouldest have brought guiltiness upon us. And Abimelech charged all the people, saying, He that toucheth this man or, or, or his wife shall surely be put to death. Now, now, Isaac's lie is a particular kind of lie. Okay, All lies are not the same. It's a particular kind of lie. The ninth commandment, for instance, tells us not to bear false witness against our neighbor. That is a different form of lying, to lie about your neighbor. Say something about your neighbor that's not true. But here is the classic lie of deceiving someone to cover yourself or to protect yourself. And verse 7 says, this is what Isaac was doing. Lest, said he, the men should should kill me for Rebekah. Verse 9, Isaac says, lest I should die for her. 
in both uh, Abraham, if you go back and look at the two times he did this, and Isaac here lying about their wife being their sister, to me it's always a little laughable. It shouldn't be laughable, but it's pathetic that in both situations, in, or in th- all three situations, they don't seem to care anything for what happens to their wife. The wording is pretty brutal. You know, that, uh, you know I, I'm not going to be killed for Rebecca. Say, you know, okay, so what is better, okay, that she, you say she's your sister and some you know, undesirable guy comes along and takes, takes her away? You know, is that better? Is that, is that a better thing? He didn't care at all. And the fact of the matter is lying to protect yourself is always selfish. Lying to protect yourself only thinks of your skin, not the skin of other people or the truth that would set some other people free. You're just worried about setting yourself free, right? Lying to protect yourself takes many classic forms. You're in trouble with your boss, so you create a half-truth that bends reality to get off the hook with your boss. Supervisor. The policeman stops you, and, and you say that you were speeding because there's an emergency at home. I got to do a drive-along with the state police, and we're on 40 up here towards Newcastle, and we're driving, we're driving, and this... Um, middle-aged gentleman, middle-aged to older gentleman, is talking on his cell phone. So we light him up, man. Pull him over, you know, and uh, I stayed in the car this time, and the trooper got out and went up, to, uh, went up to the car, and the guy doesn't get off his phone. The guy tells the, tells the trooper, puts up a finger for the trooper to wait. That's why I could never be a state trooper. Yeah, he'd have been tased, buddy. You know, kind of, you're going to get off of that phone, I had thrown it in the other side of 40 or something like that. I mean, I will kind of disrespect whatever. So I could not believe it. And I'm thinking in my mind, the only reason you're not doing something aggressive with that guy is because I'm riding along and you're afraid I'm going to tell somebody. And he comes back and he, the trooper comes back and he gets in, 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 the, in the SUV and the guy drives away. I'm like, I'm like, I can't believe it. He was like, he was like, the reason the guy stayed on the phone is his and why he answered the phone is because it was the hospital, and he verified it was a hospital. His brother had just been brought in for a heart attack. And so this is why the guy could not put down his phone, and he verified that that, that was true or whatever. What did that have to do with the sermon again? <laughs> I don't know, something. Truth to cover yourself, right? I gotta get, I'm speeding, officer, because there's an emergency at home. Your spouse discovers something, uh, so you make up a lie to clear yourself. She discovers something, you're like, oh, well, this is what, da, da. I can give a dozen examples, but as someone said this week, this kind of situation, it is so easy to lie when you're in a jam. It is such a uh, temptation to protect your own skin by telling just part of the truth or diverting the truth or withholding the truth. A few months ago, um, some most of you know this, that in the middle of the night, a teenage girl uh, demolishes my Suburban that is sitting in the front of, of my house. She just, well, she demolished it, right? And then she drove away. Listen, you're pretty lucky if you can run into a Suburban and drive away. And uh, she, tells, she tells her, the first person that she sa- sees in the night is her mother. She tells her mother that she was, uh, she hit a guardrail on Salem Church Road. And that's how her car got messed up, because she hit a guardrail. Right? She saw the officer who found her much later, and she said to the officer that she was, um, there was a car that was coming the opposite way on our road, and she swerved out of the way, and so she hit our suburban. And the last person she saw was her daddy, and she told her daddy that a bunny rabbit was hopping across the road and she avoided it and hit our suburban. True, true. This is, you can't make this stuff up. I believe that she might have been related to Isaac. (laughs) Folks, our God is above all the God of truth. His reputation, his character is built upon the fact that he, he is truth and he always tells the truth. Christ is the personification of the truth. Mercy and truth have kissed each other. Jesus is always the truth, speaking the truth. Forgive the cherry picking of these two verses without context, but they show that God is truth. Numbers 23, 19 says, God is not man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. He hath, he hath, hath he said, and shall he not do it? That means whatever he says, he's going to do. 
Or hath he spoken, shall he not make it good? Yes, he always tells the truth. It's always, it's always, he's always, what he says and what he does is equivalent. He's always truthful. Hebrews 6, 18 says th- th- this way, that by two immutable things in which it is, it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. So you know, both of those passages, it's impossible for God to lie. He's not a man that he should lie. God is God of truth. Why am I saying that? Because the God of truth saved your soul so you'd be like him, a person of truth. You don't lie to protect yourself. But there is something else, especially this sort of lie. When we lie to protect ourselves, we are, we are, we are saying, God, you can't get me out of this jam. We are saying, I've got to get myself out of this jam. We're saying, God, I can't trust you in this situation if I come clean. We are taking things in our own hands instead of trusting God. You remember that I told you early in the message to remember the points of the Abrahamic covenant that God was promising him in verse 2, 3, and 4 for this point. God just had told Isaac, I will be with you. I will bless you. That was God's promise to Isaac, but there was a disconnect in his heart between what God had said and promised him to bless him and the fear he had at that ex- exact moment of danger, of, get, of, you know, of, of being hurt for his wife's sake. There was a disconnect. Let's call that a disconnection of faith. There was a disconnection in what God had said to him by his word and how he acted in that he lied to cover himself and didn't trust that God would be with him, would be, would bless him. To protect himself, he lied, but God had promised already to be with him. God had already told him that he would handle his dangers. He should have trusted God's promises to calm his fears instead of taking things in his own hands and lied. We've been given, as I've said, many more promises about God's presence, about his help and his protection under the new covenant covenant of Jesus than Isaac ever had under the Abrahamic covenant. I want to say that again. It's because sometimes we see these stories as so big and wow, if God would do that for me and Isaac. No, 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 no. We have been given infinitely more promises of the Lord's blessing and his protection and his help and his, his taking care of us under the new covenant of Jesus Christ than Isaac ever had promises of his unfailing presence, of God's unshakable, relentless love through dangers and trials, of his almighty control so that all things, even bad things, have to work together for our good, of the bending of trials to complete my spiritual life, mature me spiritually, even the bad things, of his insane, overshadowing truth that though you may even be martyred for the sake of Jesus Christ, that not a hair of your head will be ultimately hurt. You cannot be utterly ruined because you are in the palm of his hand. We have so many more promises than Isaac. And we don't need to lie to get ourselves out of a jam. We have a God who is for us. And if God be for us, who can be against us? Even our own stupidity. Even our own problems that we get into. Our God is a loving Father who is merciful and will help us. So lying to protect yourself is foolish. Even the danger you're trying to avoid by lying is, will be the messenger of God to help your spiritual good. You understand what I'm saying? Even if you do get in trouble, the Lord even, you know, that trouble that's going to come upon you, it works for God too. I mean, it's employed by God. It is a tool of God for you, for good and his glory. Go with that and trust God in these times that it is very tempting to spin the truth. Isaac lies, and time passes. And one day, the king looks out the window and sees Isaac sporting with Rebekah. Do you see that in the Bible? By the way, this is the first recorded scriptural place of two people playing cornhole. Right here. It's right there in the Bible. They're sporting together. Gotta love this King James word. It means to play together or laughing together in a flirting kind of idea, romantic sporting it's what they're doing. The king immediately recognizes they ain't brother or sister. <laughs> All right? 
He confronts Isaac strongly and warns everyone else, don't touch Rebecca. Isaac thought that he was taking a risk, and so he lied. But the king tells him in the passage that he, would, he, he, would, he actually put himself at a greater risk point because someone could have chosen on their own to sport with Rebecca. Did you get that? And that's always true of lying. You, you're actually risking much more if you're found out and you had lied than if you told the truth. I don't know how it works in your home. I know it worked in my home. If I did something wrong and lied about it, that's two spankings. Just apply that. I probably need to encourage someone in this situation that may be here as to be a God-fearing, obedient Christian, and if you have lied, to cover yourself somewhere in your life, at work, at home, wherever. You should go and trust God's protection and make that thing right and clear your conscience and clear your fellowship with the Lord and just make it right. Come clean, be truthful in that matter, and uh, the Bible says if you would judge yourself, you'll not be judged. It's in a passage 1 Corinthians 11, about God's chastening. He loves you. Chasten yourself so that he would not have to bring bigger chastening on you to bring you back into track. Won't you do that this afternoon? Won't you do that tomorrow and clear yourself in some area? Number three, put off. Beware, put off of sin. Number three, beware of envy that can hurt others and yourself. Beware of envy that can hurt others and yourself. Look at 12. It says, then Isaac sowed in that land and received in the same year a hundredfold. That's pretty good. Any of you guys, your gardens ever do that? That's pretty amazing. And the Lord blessed him. And the the man waxed great and went forward and and, uh, grew until he became very great. For he had possessions of flocks and, and possessions of herds and great store of servants. And the Philistines, what's the next word? Envied him. For all the wells which his father's servants had digged in the days of Abraham, his father, the Philistines, had stopped them and filled them with earth, with dirt. It is amazing and a lesson about God's grace that even though Isaac lies just a couple of verses back and he lives that way to protect himself instead of trusting God, God keeps his end of the bargain and blesses him anyhow. Romans 2, 4 even has a comment on this, and it says that sometimes the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. Have you ever seen that in your life? Like you're really messed up, and you're maybe hiding something or allowing some sin area in your life, and God actually blesses you instead of, you know, what you should think bad things should happen. Sometimes God's incredible blessing on our lives is a form of, of chastening that humbles us and say, Lord, I don't deserve this. And it actually brings us to repentance because he is blessing us when we know what we are doing. Some Christians totally misunderstand God's relationship to them in this aspect. They feel like God is just waiting for them to mess up so he can hammer them. The truth is in his grace relationship with us through Jesus Christ, he is to us a patient and a loving father that is for us. That is for us in love and blesses us often despite our shortcomings and even our lack of trust like this passage. And this too is all because of Jesus Christ. That we are not treated as his enemies that he is waiting to get. We are treated as his dear children that he is waiting to get. See how I did that? Well, Isaac is so obviously blessed that by God that he gets greater and greater and greater. And though there is this famine in the rest of the promised land, he is, he is uh, multiplying, you know, hundredfold, and the Philistines envy him. Verse number 14, the end. And then notice the comment in verse number 15. For all the wells which the father, with father ser- his father's servants had digged in the days of Abraham, his father, the Philistines, had stopped them and filled them with earth. Well, that's kind of spiteful. It is unclear whether they filled the wells uh, after the time of Abraham or during the time that Isaac was being blessed, but it really doesn't matter because verse 15 connects it directly to them envying Isaac. It was the envy of both Abraham being blessed and Isaac being blessed, his son being blessed. They were spitefully filling up wells because of jealousy. Envy and jealousy are very close words. They can mean different things based on the context. 
Jealousy is usually about wanting someone. Someone. Someone's attention that I want, they're giving attention to someone else. That's jealousy that wants their attention. However, envy is about being jealous of something, wanting something. In this case, it is envy, the greed of wanting the stuff of God's blessing. They see Isaac, and he's just multiplying in the midst of a famine, and they, they want his stuff. They want that stuff. Both jealousy and envy can come out, folks, in very harmful ways. In this case, filling valuable wells that came from very, very, very hard work. Envy strikes out. It is hurtful. It wants to take away something that someone else has because you want it. You think you deserve it. Wells of water in this day, in this culture, were like gold. They sustained. It benefited everything, everyone. I'm going to talk about this tonight, about wells tonight and what it meant in the rest of the passage. But they are like, they are valuable. They sustain, it sustains life for everyone in the community. Abraham and Isaac were sojourners. They didn't own these wells. He's just coming back to these wells. Abraham didn't own this. He, he dug these wells and it benefited the people of the area and he went on to the next place. He didn't own them. The Philistines did. These Philistines were just spiting themselves, is my point, by filling up the wells. They weren't just troubling someone else. They were troubling their own people. And that's what envy does. It doesn't just hurt the one you're envying, You are spiting yourself and filling yourself with unrest and grief. Proverbs 14.30 says about envy, a sound heart is the life of the flesh, but envy the rottenness of the bones. Proverbs 27.4 says, wrath is cruel and anger is outrageous, but who is able to stand before envy? Envy is this malignant tumor within you that is worse than wrath and worse than anger. It is this ugly, growing cancer within you. What does envy look like? It, it looks like thinking about others and, and wanting their life and their lifestyle. Maybe thinking thoughts of, why did their kids turn out good and I've got all kinds of problems with mine. Or thinking about them and ascribing some negative thoughts or nitpicky thoughts about them that they really don't deserve. Picking them apart so they will appear to have negative issues because you're so envious of all the good things in their life. Envy may think thoughts like, why is God blessing them, not me? Or why am I not recognized like them? Or why am I not promoted and that woman's promoted? Why can't I have a new car like such and such family? Or why can't I have a nice house like theirs? Why can I ha- not have a second home? Envy can come out in many ways. But to the believer, the heart of envy, and this is important, is not being content with the life and the possessions and the life situations and the talents and the status, etc., that God has chosen for you, that he thinks is good for your life. Envy says, I want that person's life. I want that person's things, not what God says is good for me. Hebrews 13, verse 5 says, let your conversation, that's the word lifestyle, be without covetousness. And be content with such things as you have, for he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. The Christian lifestyle must be without covetousness. The Lord has chosen those things in your life that he thinks is best suited for you, that you can glorify him with. You should not want for something else. That doesn't mean that you should never improve your own situation. It means you should not envy the situation of others. You know, actually, as believers, shouldn't we rejoice with those who rejoice? Shouldn't I be happy when something good happens to somebody else? Yes, is that not right? Shouldn't I cheer? There is a cancer in your heart if something good, a promotion or some possession, happens to somebody else, and you go, "Mm." some, hello, envy. God, in this verse, gives the reason that we can be content in in this life, It is because we have him. So look how it plays out. And be content with such things as you have, for he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. No, you don't have a second home. You have me. No, you don't have the most up-to-date car. You have me. No, you don't have a Porsche 911 Turbo. Black, please. You have me. You have me. Think about that for a moment. There's something that you have that is more valuable than any car, any second home, any education degree, any new dress, anything that anyone else could have. 
You have the Lord. You have the Lord. He is yours and you're his. So be content because you have the most valuable thing. It is hard to resist the green eye of envy, as it is called. But learn from these Philistines that envy does not help you in any way. It just causes spite to other people and hurt to yourself. Three sins to put off. To those who have trusted here, Christ is Lord and Savior. You don't only just have a ticket to heaven, but he has personally taken responsibility to change you into the image of his son, Jesus Christ, forever and ever and ever. And part of that is being aware of sins in your life and putting them off in your life and giving glory to God and love and respect and thanksgiving to God in doing it in exercising yourself to that godliness of fighting against sin in your life. I beware from this passage of three, generational sin, lying to protect yourself, and envy that hurts yourself and others. Would you bow your heads this morning?